A very warm welcome to the first public broadcast and online premiere of Metro's Our History documentary, directed by Tom Line, our in-house filmmaker. I'm Emma Jones, Head of Insight at Metro Charity. Um, this film is the product of a National Lottery Heritage Fund award that we received in 2019. Over the course of a year, we recorded on audio and video some 35 oral history interviews with former and current staff, service users, allies and collaborators, all who've had strong connections with this charity in South East London, both in its original incarnation as the Greenwich Lesbian and Gay Centre and as it evolved in the 1990s to the Metro Centre and then the, the 2000s to Metro Charity as it is today. These recordings and the production of the charity's archive, now housed at the Bishopsgate Institute, were enabled with the input of 10 volunteers and our project archivist, Chris Scales. You'll see some examples of that rich archival collection of queer Southeast London local history and memorabilia in the 24 minute film we will soon broadcast. But without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce you to our CEO, Dr. Greg Usher, and three very special guests who will all participate in a Q&A session after the screening. So please do post your questions to them via our social media channels as you watch the film or afterwards. And first of all, I'm thrilled to welcome Jeff Hardy. And Jeff was a founding campaigner with the Greenwich Lesbian and Gay Rights Group, and he was one of the first workers at the centre. Welcome, Jeff. Hello, Emma. It's really quite something quite special to be here. Um, and I actually have the luck of having watched the film before. And I can tell you that it's one of the most inspiring films about what we can do when we work together with passion and with vision. Really well, great. And thank you so much for inviting me back. It's a real honour to have you here. Thank you so much. And we also have Colleen Humphrey. Um, Colleen, in the late 90s, 1980s, was a former youth worker and facilitator for the Centre's lesbian group, uh, among other things. And I know you've been involved in all kinds of fabulous queer work all across London as well. So we're delighted to have you with us. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to, to be here. And it was, as, through my participation, it was really nice to think back to the early days, not just the early days of the centre, but in terms of what was going on in the LGBT community at the time, it's been, it's been nice to think that. Fabulous. Well, we look forward to hearing more all about that. And we also have Sakti Suri Prakasam, who is the former director of the charity during its evolution into the Metro Centre in the mid 90s, and who directed the charity and led it through till um, the 2000s. Sakti. Hi, uh, hi. Um, hi, I'm pleased to be here. And um, personally, I've been volunteering for this project actually, and uh, was very, very lucky to have interviewed some of the people who were contributors to the charity's history over time. So it, it's really a personal privilege and pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful. And last but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Greg Usher, who has leads the charity now as its CEO, but has been with Metro Charity for more than 15 years. Greg. Yeah. Thank you, Emma. It's lovely to be here and lovely to be here with um, colleagues from Metro Charity. Um, Emma and Sakti have talked about this project beginning in 2019, the project that resulted in this film, and the project did. Um, but the archiving and the ideas around what we needed to be collecting started many, many years ago through many, many people. I think that the, there's been a, a strong sense that the period we've lived through as LGBT plus people, a period where we've fought for equality and continue to do so, and a period where we've lived through, well, two pandemics, but particularly in the 80s and 90s, the HIV pandemic, um, was a time where we needed to be collecting our stories. And I'm just delighted that this project um, not only resulted in that archive that so many of us contributed to collect collecting being deposited at the Bishopsgate Institute, but also that we have this wonderful film. And I'm really looking forward to seeing it tonight. Well, um, we're just about to start the film, so thank you, Greg. And it's 24 minutes long, so I hope uh, the audience will all stay with us. And at the end, our wonderful contributors will all be here to answer your questions. So as I said, please use the social media channels. And we look forward to seeing you in approximately 24 minutes at half past six.
How do you develop a community that doesn't actually know it's a community, has no meeting places, has no identity? What do you do? There was a chap called Tim Barnett who became the first CEO of Stonewall. And he was a councillor in Greenwich and he was openly gay. He wished to apply for funding for a lesbian and gay centre for the borough of Greenwich. Tim helped construct a funding proposal which was successful. The first thing, of course, was the post was advertised and that went out through the council network. And myself, David Simpson, Jill King, and Maggie Honey were appointed as four job share workers. I went to the job interview. It was in Greenwich, in Haddo Street, I think, over a pub or next to a pub. An upstairs office in a pub that was willing to have gay nights, and it was in the middle of Greenwich behind St Alphage. My job was being in the office talking on the phone to people, people would ring in. Uh, my art skills were used because I used to design posters, be involved in the newsletter, run the book, book club, did everything, everything. It was very small. It was very, very small. We were looking for premises. We looked at a few different places. And at the last, it was coming towards the end of our first year in post and we hadn't found premises and Bowater Road came up. The centre it was on an industrial estate in Charlton and it was right next to the Thames Barrier. Um, so I became an expert in the Thames Barrier. <laughs> I could tell everybody what it was and how it worked. The world's largest movable flood barrier, said to be the eighth wonder of the modern world. But there was nothing going on there. It, it, it wasn't a centre like the, um, like the London Lesbian and Gay Centre. I have been asked why I'm earth did you let yourself be put in a dark street down the back of an industrial estate in Charlton called Bowater Road? Why? Uh, some people felt a bit scared of it being down on an industrial estate, but other people felt more, more secure because they could go there and nobody would know they'd gone there. Because quite a lot of the women weren't out to their, you know, there was, they weren't out to their family and friends. You had to be determined. It was up a few flights of stairs. And I remember walking in and I, I, I thought it was probably going to Botley. This was um, down in um, Bowwater Road. It was on the third floor. It was a brilliant place to go. I remember, I, I don't know the name of the guy who, who worked there, he just came and greeted me and invited me in and made me a cup of tea. And then I met lots of other people, some of whom I'm still in contact with. And it was great. It was a brilliant, brilliant social area for LGBT people. The most important thing I thought about the work we were doing was how did we support people in the community? And so primarily that was through the groups that we ran, because it was through the groups that we were giving people a safe space. What we would have really good discussions there, or just good fun nights, playing darts, billiards and stuff like that. I mean, none of the people that came to the discos, the party sort of nights we had, would have gone uptown because they were living in Woolwich. And that would have been their first experience of going to somewhere socially. There were a couple of pubs locally as well. There was Gloucester in Greenwich, which was, you know, a regular place to go. I'd heard of a bar called the Gloucester and 
I went looking for it around Greenwich and I walked all around Greenwich, all around the park, and I saw this pub where, and it looked like it was full of men. I mean, I didn't know and I was very nervous. And I went in and as soon as I got in there, I realised it was a gay bar. It's the way everybody turned around and looked at you. <laughs> all men. Yeah, so that was my first experience and it was great. It was lovely. First of many. <laughs> When I was in the 80s, when it was being advertised on the television, Don't Die of Ignorance, the big tombstone. And it was one of the only things that, that frightened me at the time. A friend of mine said, you know, you just go for the test. You know, you can go for this test for HTLV3. And I just thought, you know, why not? You know, I've, I've only been out for a little while. And yeah, just go for it. I mean, you know, what's the worst that can happen? It'll come back negative, right? Yeah, I had to wait a week or longer, I think, eight days, seven or eight days for the results. So I had, to, I had that long wait just to get the result. And I'd heard it's the worst two weeks of your life. You're just going to worry. You know, it's going to be awful. And I didn't. I was like, yeah, whatever. You know, got a test and I went off because I didn't expect a positive result at all. It was, my name was called out. I was called into the room and he said, so I'm afraid to tell you that you're HIV and then it, uh, you're positive. And then just kept talking. But. I didn't really hear focus much. You kind of go into a day, it's like you've been hit. So I got the news. It was shock. I remember being um, just absolutely thrown and just feeling like I was in a tunnel, just like tunnel vision, and I couldn't hear anything. Just, just this, like a sound of waves. Yeah. I remember visited a, a friend of mine who was who was poorly. And um, they put him in a, he had his own room. And that wasn't um, for positive reasons. Obviously, that was, we don't want anyone near you. So he had his own room. And remember the, the door opening and um, someone pushing a tray of food on the floor through and closed the door and and he explained that um, that's how they delivered his food and he, he passed not long after that nobody knew what was going on and so you know you, you were getting headlines like the gay plague um, the community was in absolute panic and meltdown because we, had, we didn't know what was going on. This is before mass death, you know, where we're still trying to get our head around it in this country. But coming on the... In, in that same time as, as, as Clause 28, it, it just felt like... Like nobody cared about us. Not really. So we both kind of had a knowledge that HIV was a big issue. Uh, and we felt like health promotion we knew was doing some outreach work. And we felt like immediately there was an opportunity there. Why weren't we connected with them a bit more? That's, I think, how we got in touch with Mark McNestry. When Sackley Donna came in, it was just brilliant because, you know, they brought kind of so much new energy and enthusiasm. He was part of health promotion and doing um, HIV prevention, sexual health outreach with gay and bisexual men. And we met with him and I think immediately we started talking about the opportunities to work together. What, what happened in... In Greenwich was slightly in contrast to maybe what was happening in the centre of town, you know, with, with gay men fighting AIDS. I think what we had was we had um, this real opportunity in this in this this centre.
so Mike came in and the idea was that they would develop the project and the thinking and the places to target and where metro-based services would happen or the Greenwich Less Women Gay Centre-based services would happen. So we took a very uh, reflexive, um, responsive approach to try and understand the needs of men in the community. And that was both in terms of sex and behavioural change, but also how they socialised, what their networks were, where they had access to services. We were doing um, uh, outreach uh, to public sex environments. Uh, Michael had um, a yellow, little yellow mini, and I had a little blue um, Renault 5. <laughs> and, uh, and I think between them, you know, we were lucky if we had like one of them working on a, any particular day. Um, so, uh, so we'd get in, uh, in one of the cars and uh, with, uh, with loads of condoms and, and, and leaflets. And um, and you know, um, hang about in bushes in, on Blackheath and uh, and and outside toilets in 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 Charlton and in, in Greenwich. And then we basically just really in a quite flirty way talk to as many people as we could, ask them about safer sex, ask them if they needed condoms, ask them if they knew about safer sex. You know, we were developing a way of working on the job. You know, just kind of testing things out. When we had the results of that year's worth of work we were able then to apply for a full-scale project, HIV prevention project, based at the Lesbian and Gay Centre. What do we want to name an HIV prevention project? that's really going to attract men and it's quite sexy, but still gives the sense of what the project is about. So we wanted to identify clearly that we were about sex and penetration and thrust came out of that. I remember laughing my head off when they, told, when they said, oh, we're going to call it Metro Thrust. So for me, kind of Metro Thrust is maybe kind of a bit too assertively um, masculine. But, you know, but it was also very much in, in, in line with the messages around kind of what worked at the time, you know, around being, around, around being sex positive. And, and it did reflect the, you know, the energy, you know, the drive. What the HIV Prevention Project showed is that we needed to go out there and talk to men as well. So it did increase the traffic, definitely. But what we didn't want to ignore was the trickle of need that was around mental health. So we, we started with the mental health service with the mental health drop-in. You could come to the drop-in and one of, one of us was available to offer one-to-one -one support. So you could always have somebody to talk to. Lots of people feeling suicidal and there's lots of anxiety and lots of long-term enduring mental health issues. They wanted support with different bits and pieces and help with accessing their GP or talking to their psychiatrist. Like people were really living with difficulties and sexuality was, I think... The sexuality bit was was actually where they were not being treated very well in services. Feeling that they couldn't say where they'd been or talk about their partner or their families in a way that they felt free and able to. And that's because of, of the fear of um, a homophobic or transphobic response. People tried to pull up sexuality as an issue as opposed to the rest of what their lives were presenting them with. And sexuality was there alongside it. Over the years, we've got like bits of funding for different things in terms of providing advocacy and meeting the need from the people that were accessing it and became other than kind of a social gathering that was like four or five people to now we have like 50 people accessing <laughs> every Thursday <laughs> so it's, it's really kind of grown up it's amazing yeah We were also seeing young people coming through the door to our mental health services and through HIV prevention. So for us, it was about creating a place where we could let people grow up and be in their peer group and feel really safe. The kids that were coming to the centre um, appeared to be dealing with a lot more than purely the issues around their sexuality. 
we also knew from all of the national evidence and our experience of schools that there was a massive need for young people. I volunteered for the youth group and um, it was um, it used to be on Sunday afternoons on, on the high road um, and a very sort of very well organized, very well run and well, well structured group. Um, and it felt like that we were sort of doing something pretty valuable for the kids. Very soon after we started running the under 25s group, we realized that we needed an under 16s group. The youngest, we had two, two young guys come in one day who were about 15. It was, uh, they were from Plumstead and it was just seemed like sort of the beautiful things film <laughs> coming to life in a way. But um, it was wonderful to see how um, much younger kids had the confidence to come out. And I, I remember attending one of our youth groups, you know, like you do <laughs> sometimes. And like the kind of campness and carrying on that was just young people expressing their sexuality and being able to be free was amazing. It was lovely. It was joyful. Me and Dax Ashworth used to share an office upstairs and he was the uh, manager of the Gay Men's Sexual Health Outreach Project. So Jackie and I have worked together for many, many years um, and she was working on the 50, the 50 plus work that we were doing. Um, and that was her role. So I didn't really know her because that was a daytime job and mine was a nighttime job. And I got to learn Dax's job just by sitting next to him. And when he left, um, there was no one to fill that role. It came the fact that actually Jackie and I would go together and we would do that Game Young's Outreach work together. He would do most of the online work and database work and um, any IT things that needed happening. And I would be the forward-facing mouthpiece for everything. So I would be on the one on the stage talking and he would be the one dealing with all the money. And we were a very good team. And then we just started doing, you know, what, what things could we possibly do that would encourage gay men so we could talk to them about, you know, safe sex and give out condoms and get people into the clinic. And so we would just think of weird and wonderful ideas and um, events. And one of the ones that I had heard about previously that used to be done many years ago by Dax Ashworth and them. And I, um, I probably just started a conversation with Jackie about doing it again. And since then it's happened, which is the pride boat that we do every year um, which was taking uh, just a group of probably about 120 odd gay residents up to pride up to Westminster Pier and we decided to make it a party basically uh, they had a bar on board um, they asked us whether we wanted that open or not and we said absolutely um, and and I did the music because I am a DJ our point at the time was to try and talk to as many gay men as we can try and try and get them onto a mailing list so we could try and message them about future events that we'd have and during this time and we would always embed this somewhere into any party we had we would be doing surveys or doing education around sexual health with everybody on the boat the, the discussion wasn't just about how we're going to have a party and how we're going to celebrate and play but also how do we include people who are marginalized within the lgbt community who might not feel supportive at such an event that was one of the few spaces where actually what you got is a real mix of service users, volunteers, staff, everybody bunched in together. That was brilliant to all be on that boat and just sailing up the river. We all arrived on the pier in Greenwich and piled onto this boat and I had a feeling there was even a bus. It was the time where you started from near Charing Cross Station to the Pride route. And the youth groups used to love it. And they loved being in an open top bus for possibly their first ever Pride when they were 16. Um, it, was, it was really lovely to see how excited they would be. I just remember it being great because there was a whole load of us from the centre when loads of women I knew from the centre when Being supported by hundreds and hundreds of LGBT people, I think to stand up and be counted even if it's just for one day, it just allows people to just see how many LGBT people there actually are. I was working with someone who had a horrific time in Uganda and lots of difficulties with 
the police there and abuse and all kinds of horrific things. When she came to Pride with us, she looked up and she could see the police marching in, in the parade. She's like, Taz, there were police, there were gay police marching in the parade. That's incredible. And the tears that are coming down her face. I spent the whole day crying, looking at this big quilt made up of all these AIDS quilts. Thinking, no, you know, because I'd just been diagnosed myself, so it was very emotional pride for me. I swore I was going to go to every pride, and I did for a long time. There was always conversation, and still is always conversation about how, how people who might be experiencing uh, mental health issues, or how young people who've never been to a pride before, um, or how older people are going to traverse the whole route, and whether we need to provide alternative access for arrangements for people who can't walk that whole way and that sort of goes to the core I think of who we are there's a sort of care there about inclusion which is I found really great. Greenwich Lesbian and Gay Centre got a foot in the door from that moved to Greenwich High Road wondered why we had ever chosen Bowwater Road found out why and then moved into being a wider based project, but at which there would be a hub. Its hub was Greenwich Lesbian and Gay Centre. I'm really proud that it still exists, that there must have been something in what we did that still has value and still speaks to both funders and to the people who are using it. It certainly felt for us that we were creating something, a community. And I think that's borne out by the fact that there are people who are still connecting and, you know, talk about the Metro as being really important to them. It changed people's lives that, that came there. It was definitely something very positive. The fact that, you know, in a sense, we, we did ensure that, um, that a community was, was represent a marginalised community and that that community has then been able to just kind of, you know, grow and, um, and, and thrive. I was one of many, many people walking for change, but we did make a difference. And I'm proud of the difference we made. So yes, congratulations again to Tom for a wonderful film who's behind the scenes here, teching for us. Um, for those who might not have joined us uh, at the beginning, um, my name's Emma Jones, I'm head of Insight at Metro Charity, and we have some very special guests with us this evening who are all um, appeared in the film, so you may have noticed or heard. We didn't see Jeff, actually, I just realized, because you were on audio, so we have Jeff Hardy, Sakti Surya Prakasam, and Colleen Humphrey, and our CEO, um, Greg Usher. Um, I'd just love to kick off with one question myself um, and watching the film again it made me immediately think of um, the other pandemic I suppose and that, that sense that we're in you know, times that we've been living through and um, just now and this, what that evokes for people I've just wanted to open it out if anybody had anything to say about that sense of the parallels between that time and the current period. I don't know, Colleen, we have to unmute you, I think. I think um, it's quite emotional. Um, look, when you hear what you said in, in a moment, in a, in a conversation, um, 
But I, I think for me, one of the differences was at that time when we had a real sense that we there was the beginning of this pandemic. And I think I, and I touched on it slightly in the film, which was that apart from the community itself, nobody cared. And people were dying alone. They were dying in a way that made them feel mar marginalised and almost like it's your fault. That was the environment. And obviously things have changed, but they changed because of the way the community fought for change, fought for recognition, fought to have the issues raised, fought to um, to start providing services for ourselves, to support ourselves. You know, the charities that came out of that time that are still here um, and the ones that have gone, there was so much that as a community we did to make the situation better. And I think the only real link I would make with this current pandemic is that that's happened again, the sense of people coming together to make a difference, to help each other. But I also think they were, they're very different because um, at that time, it was really focused on a particular section of society. You know, of course, that later changed um, around the world, but but here it, it very much. It was, yeah, it was just, it was difficult. I think that's my point. I found it, you know, it was a really difficult time, and I still feel very sad about what we have to go through. Sure. Um, thank you, Colleen. Oh, please, Sakti. And Greg afterwards. So I am um, kind of involved through my job in Lewisham with uh, coordinating the COVID response for the community, including doing things like food delivery and befriending services and stuff. And I think, uh, uh, just to echo what Colleen says, I think genuinely at the time of the HIV crisis, it felt definitely like we were in a corner on our own, fighting our own fight. Whereas if I reflect on the COVID response in Lewisham, it's definitely a response that's a system-wide response supported by everybody. And the differences, I guess, is that we started in the days of HIV from a position where there were particular groups, uh, and particularly us, feeling stigmatized, really. And uh, what's different about the pandemic now is that we're discovering that there are, starting from a position of it affects all of us, discovering that actually there are certain groups that are hugely disproportionately affected. So arriving at, the, at that same place, but from different um, starting points, I guess. That's my reflection. Thank you. Greg, you were coming in. I would echo that. I think that, that's what I was going to say about stigma and the parallels there. I also think that the um, central government responses um, to HIV and to COVID have been similar and different. Um, there was a, uh, in the 1980s in this country and in other countries, there was a head in the sand approach from central government towards HIV. They didn't want to know. Um, there, which indicate, which meant that we as a community had to advocate, resist, fight to ensure that this was on the agenda, political agenda. Um, that's not been the case here with COVID, but by the same token, there's been a degree of um, uh, disorganisation and dissembling even from central government about the COVID response. I think locally, and this was probably the case with the case with HIV, there has been local system-wide responses which have been miraculous but some of the um, direction we're getting in relation is in relation to COVID has been less than um, consistent and remains so I think and that 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 echoes some of the stuff that I remember from HIV in various countries in which I lived. Jeff I think you had something as well please. Yeah I think one of the things I remember about those years was that there were the 
innocent victims who weren't queer, like the haemophiliacs and others who got infected blood, nothing to do with them. But if we became infected, it was our fault. Um, and I, feel, I still feel my anger towards that. And then in the that you get section 28. And I think one of the big differences between now and then is that then it was a specific, it, it felt like an attack that was not supported by government, that was not supported largely by people who were not gay themselves or lesbian themselves. And that, that for me is a big difference, is, is that there's a sympathy around now, a caring. And I, I agree with Greg, it, there's very much about local groups doing things. But the difference, I think, between the government response with COVID and this is it's a blundering mess now. It was deliberate. It was damn well deliberate on a lot of fronts, um, particularly in America, but also, also here at the beginning, that gay plague, that wrath of God coming down on you. We do not hear the religious right bleating like now. And I think one of the similarities for me is trying to get across in those days that if you didn't wear condoms, you were endangering others. It wasn't about you, it was about other people. And I think one of the similarities I'm noticing now, I don't know what it's like in London, but up in Shrewsbury, is an enormous disregard for other people's health. You do not protect their health by wearing a mask. You, so it's, it's not yet entered the consciousness of most people that you wear a mask to protect other people's health. Just like you wore a condom, you practice safer sex to protect other people's health. Um, but yeah, it's a time I remember only too well. I'm amazed that I survived it. Was, was just every little symptom we got. And right at the beginning of this, I had that mirror again. The sense that every little symptom you had, were, oh my God, it's me now. But the thing I really felt then was, it really was, death sentence if you were diagnosed and there was nothing there was no medication at all and some people have survived i know people have survived but yeah and, and, and so on top of that you have the prejudice and i do actually remember colleen going to see uh, an ex-flatmate of mine from when i lived in london well, I went all the way down from Shrewsbury to Morden to visit him in the hospital, the Royal Marsden, Marsden Hospital. He was 25 years old, Nigerian, and scared to death. And where was he? In an isolation room, the last place he needed to be. And he was, there were people coming in with masks and gloves, and there, yeah, the food being pushed on across on the floor. And all he needed was some touch and some love and some caring and some company. I think that in a that's one similarity for today. A friend of mine um, who's 35, his partner died a few weeks ago from COVID, and he couldn't visit until the very last moment. So he had a, quite a long period. The guy died in mid-April quite a long period of being unable to visit um that's just so painful isn't it so similarities differences but what a period for me to go through certainly uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, just thinking about something uh, Mark McNestry um, said uh, during the film about, in terms of the HIV prevention work that was going on locally, he, he talked about the contrast between gay men fighting AIDS in central London. And it just struck me that um, although Metro has a wide reach now geographically, that its roots are very local, very much in southeast London. Um, and I just wondering, um, all of you, but also I'm thinking particularly Sakti from the, the days that you started working, because I know you started in Woolwich. You could maybe say something about that local, that localism, and what it what it meant, and why it was important. 
Well, uh, I have to say we were very, very far removed from the idea of the glamorous central London, <laughs> middle class, clubby lifestyle. I have to say it. I mean, uh, you know, anybody who's been to the Woolwich Infant will know that <laughs> what we're talking really about is a very socioeconomically deprived area uh, with people who are living in estates and facing the stigma of being queer on a housing, very deprived housing estate in Woolwich. So, you know, the people we were dealing with were people who had cyclical mental health issues that, and, and a number of them had been institutionalized and continued to be. Uh, we dealt with people who didn't have many resources. We dealt with young people who were growing up in poor households, you know, who were experiencing a lot of uh, homophobia in schools. These were real issues. They weren't anything people could escape by going up to central London and having a nice drink and a dance. Even if people had had the resources to do that, it wasn't stuff you could escape. So that's, you know, partly why, for me, one of the important things about uh, running a queer centre is, sure, let's create a space that's a, a sanctuary, if you like, for people. But let's also not forget we need to do the work out there in the places where people live and socialise and, you know, go out. Um, and have to go to, like like statutory sector services. They're, they're places we need to change too. It's not just about creating a safe space where we are. Thank you. Greg, I'm just wondering from your perspective, coming from Australia into this uh, local neighbourhood that you adopted, how was yeah. that as a, coming to grips with what South East London was from Australia? The, uh, the the two words that Sakti said that really resonate with a Woolwich infant. So my first experience as a um, gay man of a gay venue in London was a Woolwich infant where there was a security camera at the door um, where inside uh, to move a bar stool was virtually impossible because it was stuck to the beer sodden carpet. Um, and it was, it was an absolute experience having come from, at that point, very glitzy waterside Sydney. Um, but um, it was clearly local and it was clearly um, what, what I walked into at Metro, where we were on Greenwich High Road, was an organisation that um, was reaching and talking to and communicating with people who needed our support. So it felt like the right place to be. And I think that con continues. So even though we've grown and have offices now in Lewisham and Vauxhall and Essex and Kent and Medway and Surrey, that localism still defines the sorts of relationships we build in each of those communities with service users, with other charities, with um, people in, with the NHS, with local authorities. It's still all about the local relationships we're, uh, we're able to, to make. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Colleen, I'm also thinking of you as a, a proud North Londoner, I know. Tottenham supporter, I believe. <laughs> that you, um, you, made that, you made that trip, you crossed the river. I mean, how, how was that as a culture change for you and what was it like? Well, I, before joining, um, British Lesbian Gay Centre, I'd worked for Haringey, um, doing lesbian and gay youth work in Haringey, and also with a little bit of work in what was at that point Haringey Lesbian and Gay Centre. So I, I've been a professional queer for a long time, despite the young look that I clearly have. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so I started as a, as a mere fetus. Um, I, I think that there was definitely something about resources. Um, there, there was more funding available in the north of the, the capital. Um, but in terms of the issues, it was, it was all the same. It was very much all the same. Um, and that was both in terms of the issues for the community and 
the reaction from the wider community to our needs and to our issues and the ways that we wanted um, to become more visible, uh, whether that was through the provision of services, um, housing, considering our health needs. Um, so the issues were very much the same, but, but the, the North was definitely richer, absolutely. I mean, to, to speaking, I'm just thinking of the, the context um, of um, the Greater London Council and Ken Livingstone's administration and various things that were going on. I mean, obviously, there were other um, equalities issues being fought and discrimination. And, and, and in terms of um, race relations at the time, and the context of working in, in Queer Centre then, what, what, how was that on the agenda and how were, were issues of, of race um, within London as within the community, I suppose? And, and your work for both for you and in, 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 I'm thinking in the late 80s particularly Colleen. So, there was a time when we had a Greenwich Lesbian and Gay Centre, a London Lesbian and Gay Centre, you had the Black Lesbian and Gay Centre project and I know Sati will be able to possibly say some more about that, you had Camden Lesbian and Gay Centre, Harringay Lesbian and Gay Centre, Islington put some money in the pot. Um, so in terms of uh, places to find support and help there, there was, a, there was a real recognition. But in terms of BMAE, with the exception of the Black Lesbian and Gay Centre, I remember I called it a project, I didn't call it a centre, the centre project. I think resources were different. I think on a personal level, I, I was a member of the community, but I still faced racism. Um, I still faced uh, misogyny. Um, and, and I think it's, there hasn't always been a recognition that we are many communities that make up one. We are not one homogenous community. And I, and I think that, I'm not sure we've got that right yet. And until we do, we can't meet all our needs. So just, just picking up on that and thinking, and also Sakti, obviously, in terms of your experience with Black Lesbian and Gay Centre, but that's a sort of issue of diversity, both obviously at you coming in as staff, but what about service users and members, people who were, what, what was the diversity like um, in groups and so on in the late 80s, early 90s? Well, sorry, go I think um, we just need to remember what it was like to go along to a um, lesbian and gay, and uh, they often were lesbian and gay as opposed to LGBT in those days. But um, when you turned up your average lesbian and gay group, this is your experience as the only black person, right? So, um, you know, these groups were desperate to get their group groups to be more diverse. So they were desperate to get black people in. And we had the same experience, you know. We would do a lot of outreach and try to get information out there. And then what would happen is uh, uh, the one black person would turn up, take a look around and think, oh dear. <laughs> and then they would find it very difficult to come back. Because, you know, where was the parity in terms of, there is, you know, it's great to find your tribe in terms of having queer people around you. But if you don't see yourself reflected in all of those faces, it's quite hard to think, do I fit here? Do I belong? So I think that was definitely an issue. And uh, certainly South London and Southeast London often feels or felt in those days quite white. Uh, apart, even apart from the queer community, the, the whole community felt quite white, even though it's actually a very diverse area, Greenwich. Um, so, we, you know, I have to put hand on heart, say we tried very hard, but it wasn't that diverse a group of people who came. Um, we got better at it. And I think actually probably, Colleen, in your time, you probably did better than we did in mine. Would you say? Um, this, this I will say, and, this, and I think you've just, you've just made me remember this. In terms of in, within the groups and the different organised uh, 
as it was then, lesbian and gay events, groups, etc. As you said, there wasn't a strong BAME presence. But at night time, it changed. So at night time, I went to many a party in South London, and it was just black people. Yeah. So in terms of the community was there, and there were nights and club nights forming. So it was all, it was like everybody came out at night, and that's where the friendships and the networks and the connections that were made that were then taken into the daytime um, and into their experience of being supported, etc. But yeah, we all turned up at night. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> So speaking of nightlife, because we're, you know, this is a, a, a summer program <laughs> uh, and we're all missing, I'm sure, some nightlife, uh, proper nightlife at the moment. But um, Jeff, do, in terms of the early days, um, you touch on it in the film, just thinking about the 80s. Uh, can you give us a sense of what it was like um, in Greenwich and the neighbouring boroughs, the scene? What was it like in the mid 80s? Um, well, um... <laughs> Prior to the end, you had a huge rise in the National Front. There was a hell of a lot of racism. Um, I taught in Charlton Boys School in the mid-70s, so I was well aware of the undercurrents that were going on. Um, it also gave me some hope. I know it's a bit of a preamble, but it also gave me hope about when I became a worker and when I was involved with trying to get funding for it, in that the... the the lads that I taught at Charlton Boys School, secondary school, were really positive when I came out. They, they were just wanting to know. So that gave me some hope. Um, but when we, when we were first setting up, I think it's, it's not just that the community didn't know it was a community. I'm with Kalina, you know, I think it was you that said, there are lots of different communities and people can be marginalized within their own community or not feel safe in in the wider community and certainly in the early 80s I, I remember going to the castle in Lewisham to see drag acts who were misogynist anti-lesbian racist and people were laughing and cheering no wonder a lot of women didn't go no wonder a lot of black people did not go they did not feel comfortable they walked through the door they heard these these jokes about um how all black men are incredibly well endowed not they wonderful in bed or they just got plain plain nasty racism so i think you know we have to go back to that um and equally it was, it was a very impoverished area for many people it was a really tough life so you, we were starting out in a in a sense in this desert of venues in within Greenwich itself. Also, there was a real fear of being seen to be who you were. So I think a lot of people, when one of the fears, one of the things we had to think about whenever we ran events was we noticed a lot of the people who came to the event did not live in Greenwich. They lived somewhere else. And the Greenwich people would go off somewhere else because there was a fear of being seen. So I think we had to kind of cross that bridge. I think it's still there in, in many rural areas up in Shropshire. That, and maybe it's still true in the city because the city has lots of communities. The fear of being seen by your own community crossing that door and they know where you're going and you you have that fear within you whether or not it's in reality so i would say one of the biggest difficulties we had and forget i mean i left when it actually became a center but was was just how do you get people to involve themselves and come together um when you have all that going on as well so does that kind of am i kind yeah, of yeah yeah no absolutely i mean i think you you said about in the film how there, there just was nothing and um mm -hmm. how the center actually created this social space and um, but i just well um we've had a question um from somebody by email that you probably see up in your screen there um from peter roscoe saying what next what are the priorities for the lgbtq community now and over the next five years and i'd love to go to you with that greg um who's our ceo 
and maybe others can chip in when we uh, hear what Greg has to say. <laughs> oh, are you on mute? Thanks, well, uh, Greg. I'm, I'm happy to start, but I'm sure others will have um, different views and and different visions. And I, I, I would pick up on Colleen's point from before and just slightly reframe the question, what are the priorities for LGBT communities now and over the next five years? Because I think there's different communities within us. And what that speaks to me about is, um, I think the biggest priority is inclusion and authentic inclusion. Um, I think um, what has been highlighted through Black Lives Matter for example, is that within our own community, there are issues that need to be addressed around inclusion. The same applies across um, disability. Um, the same applies across class. And we've just alluded to that a little bit, but it's certainly something that resonates with um, Metro. So the idea, and, and I think one of the very important inclusion issues, and it's a touchstone issue, um, is the uh, how we as communities, gender brothers and sisters and colleagues and friends, um, to uh, resist um, the current onslaught um, that is coming from a whole range of different angles. Um, and it, that, that onslaught reminds me of the onslaught that was... Um, picked up in, in our film, that onslaught in the late 80s, it just seemed to be um, overwhelming. And so we have, we have, I think, over the next years to ensure that we're holding and supporting our brothers and sisters in, in the trans, in transgender communities. The other thing I'd add just from the charity's perspective over the next five years is that um, we are really keen to acknowledge that um, LGBTQ people are disproportionately affected on a range of different issues, whether it's around mental illness or um, alcohol and other drugs or um, domestic violence or um, uh, HIV. But by the same token, LGBT communities come with a range of different assets not just deficits. And those assets uh, include their own aspirations and ambitions and creativity and spirituality and, and awareness. And they're the sorts of things that we want to, as a charity, tap into for our staff and our volunteers and our service users. Thanks so much, Greg. I think Colleen was ready to come in. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm just gonna focus on one priority. Um, and that for me is around housing. Um, we have, we've come a long way in terms of being able to safely live in our own homes, but we also have traveled a short distance at the same time. So there are many people within our various communities who are still experiencing discrimination in their own homes. They're still victims of hate crimes in their local communities. And what, there's a couple of things I want to highlight. Uh, so it was last year, Stonewall did a piece of research looking at um, young people in universities and their experience of being LGBT in university. And what it identified was that a lot of young people are struggling. They're not able to get the best degrees that they can get because they're dealing with discrimination. They're dealing with hate crime. They're dealing with um, living in environments where they can't be themselves. And we all know, you know, when, when you're LGBT, you, we all know how much energy we have to spend um, risk assessing. Everywhere we go, whatever we do, there's this constant risk assessing going on. So we have an issue with our young people being able to have safe places to live. And then I think that extends across all ages and then we finally get to our older generation. And I have, you know, I remember talking about this. I think it was, it was in the late 80s, actually, for a, some documentary about what are we going, how are we going to look after ourselves in retirement? How are we going to create the, and I want to talk about communities, not residential homes, 
the communities where we can continue to be ourselves, where we can move in with our same-sex partner um, and not be separated, is what happens to people now. So I would put housing up there. It's a huge issue. And I also want to be slightly cheeky, because I am. I, I, I invite... I, I want to set a challenge, really. We have, in terms of organisations like Metro Charity, Stonewall, other group, we have a richness of talented people who are working to solve key and important issues and improve the lives of the LGBT communities. So my question, sorry, <laughs> coming back will be, what can we do to get to, to work more closely together? um because there has to be a way the objectives are exactly the same yeah make improvement making things better how can we do that so i'll, I'll invite our ceo to have an answer that if he may afterwards oh sakti yes please um i i was gonna say that um after having lived comfortably <laughs> in my semi-nice middle-class, uh, uh, you know, uh, living, I suddenly find myself, I think, uh, caught short and horrified by the things that are happening. And I kind of feel like we're in this moment where we stand to lose all of the gains we've made in the last 20, 25 years because of the forces that are working against us currently. I've, I feel like sometimes I wake up and I don't recognize the world that I live in. So like Greg, um, and you know, the, the whole thing with the Black Lives Matters is uh, what it really shows us is that these incidents that are captured on camera, you know, they are just, they're not new. Nothing has gotten worse. These things are the result of institutional discrimination and, and racism, sexism, all of the stuff that's existing and bubbling under the surface. So like Greg, I just believe we're in a moment where we need to create alliances between us as communities. We need to really think about equalities and we need to take a really strong leadership approach around creating those alliances with other communities and to fight back this massive tide of the right coming up against us. I, I feel very strongly about that. Jeff, uh, thank you, Sakti. I think Jeff wanted to add um, or say something. Yeah, I think it comes back to the difference between rights and liberation. You can win rights, but if you fight on a single issue, those rights can be taken away because what you haven't done is reached out and realized that your struggle is the Black Lives Matter struggle, is the struggle of the unemployed, is the struggle of the miners back in the 80s or the printers back in the 80s, is the struggle of people who seek asylum. People seeking asylum. You know, if there's one issue that I would bring out and say, we really got to get on top of, within the lesbian and gay and bisexual trans community is racism definitely and that is not something out there to support it is to realize that it's not a matter of supporting it's realizing that the struggle of other people's struggles is your struggle too so if we don't get that it's our struggle as well and that leads me to think about pride in london and I, the last time i went uh, not this year, because I went with GLF and we did our own little thing. But the last time I went, there were massive commercial floats for BAE systems, for for companies out there. And I don't want to, be, I feel no pride in that. So one of the priorities I would say is to start to connect back to what is it that oppresses us, that also oppresses other people? What is it the bigger that we need to change? And therefore, we need to also tackle the far right who are coming on really heavily because one of the biggest groups that they are going for, apart from going for trans, and the next lot are going to be LGB people as well, is people seeking asylum. 
if we other people, if we don't realize that what's going on in other countries is impacting on us and it is our British penal codes over there in many places that are creating the problems, we have to start owning up to that just in the same way as we have to start to owning up to the amount of privilege that we have over here because of um, enslavement of other people. So I think there are a number of joint things that I think we need to wake up a little bit. Um, and also I just wanted to add as regards older people being an older person, uh, I'm 70 this year, you know, like there's that sense of our in Trotsky, we have a group called SAN, Safe Aging, No Discrimination. Um, I don't know whether the Metro Centre is working on this, but we would be really happy for you to have a, have a good look at our website. We've got masses of material on it. But it is a really important thing because, you know, if ever I have to have carers coming into my home, I don't want to feel disempowered. And recently, a friend of mine who was very prominently involved in lesbian and gay struggles back in the 70s and 80s, uh, somebody who was not the sort of person ever to take any, anything thrown at him. He would get up and he would fight. And the situation happened in his home. And he felt that he could not stand up for himself to that care worker, that care agency. And I, I just think we need to work very, very carefully and very quickly with the care agencies because, you know, aside from anything else, every, everybody stands on somebody else's shoulders. I stand on other people's shoulders. But the very people who were fighting back in the 70s are the people who are now going to be needing, possibly needing, I hope not, but possibly needing care, possibly need to go into a place. I don't want to go back in the closet. I will not go back in the closet, but I may need a lot of support. So I think that's one of the things that we need to do as well as wake up. Thank you, Jeff. Oh. Greg, please. I've, I've got a question coming in from somebody, a new question, but please, let's finish on that. I don't, well, I just wanted to pick up on Colleen's very explicit challenge about working together. I think that's a very important question. And I wanted to, um, first of all, highlight that as a result of COVID, the LGBT sector, LGBT groups and organisations are experiencing very significant stress and distress and, and um, luckily some funders including Comic Relief have recognized that. Um, so Comic Relief have um, built a pot from the big night in of £650,000 and Metro has been selected along with our partners across the UK. So Metro leading the Equality Network in Scotland, um, Umbrella Cymru in Wales, the Rainbow Network in Northern Ireland, Birmingham LGBT and Yorkshire Mesmac to build a small grants program across the UK um, administered by panels of LGBTQ people to distribute that money in micro, small, medium and large grants to groups and organisations, LGBTQ groups and organisations with annual turnover of less than uh, 100,000 pounds. So what that means, I think, is that there's there are opportunities for us to work together. Uh, and you're absolutely right. If if we don't, particularly in this in this time and at a, at, at a time in the immediate past where we saw the disappearance of crucial LGBT charities like um, Pace, like Broken Rainbow, like others, then we will see the gains we've made disappear. Okay, I'd just like to raise a new question that's come uh, through over, I think, social media. Um, now people are coming out at an earlier age. Do you think the word questioning is still needed, still relevant? Uh, I don't know who would... Uh, oh, we've got Greg, sure. And then um, Pauline, I think, afterwards. I do. Um, the film talked about, Sakti talked about the youth groups that Metro runs 
Um, we run groups for 12 to 16 year olds, 16 to 25 year olds. Um, we run trans youth groups. Um, we run VME, LGBTQ youth groups across London and in um, the home counties, um, 13 groups a week. And we've made that transition during COVID of running those groups quite creatively online over the last three or four months. But particularly in that younger group, the 12 to 16 year old group, many children and young people are coming to us saying they're not really sure. Um, some are just saying that, some are very, very sure, and some are questioning. And to provide a safe space that's um, provided by um, sure LGBTQ people, experienced youth workers, I think is very, very valuable for people to be able to safely uh, question their identity and reach where they need to reach. Thank you, Greg. Colleen. I thought I had to black. <laughs> <laughs> Sexy. Um, I, and I think regardless of what anybody says, I still think schools are the last bastion of homophobia, <laughs> you know, because gay is still a word that's derogatory that people use very easily in schools. So this is the place where the younger people who are, uh, who are questioning or coming out are going to be, and they're not necessarily protected. So I think that's why that term is still important and we need to recognize it. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, had you, were you putting your hand mm. up there? Yeah, please. Do, my question is, do the young people themselves still think that the word questioning is important? And what I'm hearing from XYZ Youth Group in Shropshire, and by the way, that is the only funded group by any authorities within Shropshire. Yes, Sand's got funding, but it's lottery. There is nothing infrastructure-wise in, in Shropshire. But XYZ group very much say there was nothing in school when, in fact, they were asked recently, could you, by their worker, we've been asked to ask you, um, what support did you get in schools? What information did you get in schools? They all burst out laughing. There are one or two schools within Shropshire that, well, I say more than one or two, maybe three or four, that are working really hard, primary and secondary. One school even has an LGBTQ website, which is great on their, on their website. But as regards trans, we've just had the trans guidance stuff wiped off by the action in Oxfordshire, which was built by the Christian right. So, you know, it comes back to the earlier thing of we need to fight our battles. But I think questioning is something people are bound to do if they haven't got anything they can go, oh, that's me. And, you know, it's just, you know, we, we still only get an enormously small amount of media that cover, covers our, our stories. So, I think we have got to redouble our efforts as, a, as an ex-teacher to work really, really hard because one of the things I've noticed, certainly up here and how true it is in London, how few teachers are out and open. Yeah, I mean, I was in the mid-70s as one of the few, but I expected now that there'd be loads, and yet the schools that I've been into and talked to I find uh, I'm saying, well, does anybody here want to identify themselves before I go on to talk about other things? Not one does. And that's scary. So that means that the kids are being taught by people who are invisibilizing themselves. That's not a positive message. So, yes, I think in the end, yes, ask them what they think. Do you, do you young people, think that this word is still important? In my view, it probably is. And can I just add, I think that the, it's, sometimes it's not about um, children and young people coming to us questioning their identity, but coming to us with questions about their identity. What does it mean for me to be gay? And so what do I do now? Just very simple questions about yeah, that. 
Thank you, Greg. I mean, thinking about obviously the wider bracket of obviously sexuality and and both and gender identity, there's a question that came through or a comment that came through earlier, which really is, it presents an interesting question. But it's a little binary and um, talking about uh, somebody saying, I remember that men and women were separate to um, quite an achievement and new thing at the centre to be working together. Um, I was going to ask about this earlier, actually, um, because when we were reading some of the early archival documents, it's very interesting how some of the early meetings in the uh, 1984, and Jeff might remember this, where um, the men and women, the lesbians and gay men, split almost immediately into separate rooms to, um, there were issues uh, working together. Um, so I've just wondered if anybody wanted to comment on the, that sort of sense of, of the alliances. And so you also mentioned about that it was lesbian and gay, and that's how I'm framing it in that way, thinking of I suppose the 1980s um, and when things were less diverse, perhaps. What was that? How was it between uh, lesbians and gay men? Oh right, back in the back in the 80s, uh, I think it was one of the toughest colleges I've ever been to. Um, this is how I look at it now. <laughs> it was incredibly uncomfortable because, you know, I remember the when the when GLF split, Gay Liberation Front split, and the women walked out because here were these men who were getting into drag and as men and challenging gender, but not really looking at behaviour, and I include myself in that. Um, and then in, in the eighties, I think there's a limit of that how much effort women were having to put in to even get a say in anything in any meeting because they men men talk easier. You know, we do, you know. Um and that's part of the training. So they got pissed off with us and they got fed up with the sexism the anti-lesbian stuff, the jokes about lesbians, all this stuff was coming up. So I'm not at all surprised that the separateness happened. I think it was a necessary thing to empower. Um, but it was damned uncomfortable. I remember it really hitting hard at the London Lesbian and Gay Centre, vicious debates. Uh, around SM, bisexuality, uh, we don't want bisexuals in the centre, we feel threatened, um, we, we don't want um, SM because SM is about anti, you know, it's anti women, the whole thing around pornography, which I, you know, I think there are some very valid arguments around that. So it was a very difficult time. And there was a necessity at the time, and there may still be, I think, for women-only space, women-only groups, places where women felt, yeah, we, we can talk here and we can find ourselves within this group and find our power and then come back in. Having said that, I think it's an incredible achievement that uh, both up here in Shropshire and down where you are at Metro, you're working together very very well and i think that over the years maybe a lot of learning has been done on the men's side i hope so um i'll leave it at that i think uh, sakti if you to add to that please yeah um, so i'm i'm just an old bra burning feminist so i'm going to say <laughs> I've always thought it's important to have um, gender specific spaces, uh, spaces for black people, spaces where people can feel like they can share their experiences with other people who share that experience. However, I have recently, I recently went to the WOW Festival and probably attended the only space and it was a workshop for the first time, the Wild Festival, which is the Women of the World Festival, has been running for 10 years. And uh, this year um, was the first time uh, that they actually um, 
No, it wasn't this year because lockdown had started, I think, by the time the WOW Festival it must have been last year. It was the first time they actually had um, a workshop on intersex um, and, and issues of intersex um, sexuality issues for people to discuss. There was a panel of people who identified as intersex um, people who were amazing. And what it struck me was that actually one of the responsibilities of an organization like the Metro is to create safe spaces to heal some of the schisms that have developed massively between our communities. So I think the more there is safe space for people to express their views and come to agreement, I think that is a fundamental role of an organization like the Metro. And I, I'm always really up for being in those spaces and hearing what people have to say. Colleen, were you, you, you look like you want to add to that. Yeah, uh, Jeff got me started because he, he was bringing back the memories. Um, I mean, I, I do, I do agree with Jackie here in terms of the importance of uh, having specific spaces that are identified for specific groups. There's a there's an energy and uh, um, and a strength that's born out from seeing and being with people like you, whatever like you is. Um, and then there's also, you know, as importantly, the importance of being in a space which is so, which is really inclusive, because that also can fuel you, um, and and being able to share and be with other people who aren't like you is also really important. I think there was that time in the 80s, Jeff, you're absolutely right, so much went on. And I'll just mention one thing in case people don't know, and this is where our history and the work that you guys are doing is so important, is there used to be a march called the Lesbian Strength March. Mm -hmm. And the Lesbian Strength March took place a week before Pride. And at one point it started at the Lesbian and Gay Centre, so we marched from the Lesbian and Gay Centre. I can't remember where we ended up. I think I may have been drinking too much, but we stopped at some point. But at, there was a point where there was so much more, so many more opportunities to be amongst, say, for example, lesbians or, ex, ex, you know, if you wanted that as well as to share. And there was a reason for that. There A lot of it was a reaction as well. And I, I don't think times have completely changed. Yeah. Um, so I think the people who want to be in inclusive space will make it inclusive for everybody else. Yeah. But there's no forcing it. You can't force it. And that, that importance of having those separate spaces, I think, continues just like the importance of the youth groups it's about young people being together they understand each other's experiences they need older people to help facilitate them not to join them yeah um uh so i'm a i'm a fan but yes i i remember the battles and it, it some of it was it was sad especially the battles within the lesbian community was awful no more of that <laughs> Thank you, Colleen. Uh, got another question that's come in, um, actually from Natalie Kaufman, who was one of the contributors um, to the film. Here we are. So what issues do you think LGBTQI people are facing now that are different from when the Les Greenwich Lesbian and Gay Centre started? That's a big one. <laughs> who would like to tackle that? Oh, Greg, you're, you're willing? Feel I'm happy to start again. Wonderful. Um, uh, and I, it's the issues we confront as communities are often very, very time specific. So right now, um, as we live through this pandemic, I think LGBT communities are experiencing very, very intense isolation. Um, we know that from surveys we've conducted with our service users, and that that has very significant impacts on people's mental health and emotional well-being um, and i think that's a, an intense 
aspect of what's happening in LGBT communities right now. Similarly, there is no avoiding um, for us as uh, as members of this, these communities, um, the significance of the inclusion agenda that's been um, compelled justifiably on us and through us through the Black Lives Matter. Um, and we must address that. And that's very different, I think, to some of the um, erasure and of invisibility of, of, of at the birth of Metro Charity. Um, similarly, I think right now, um, issues around domestic violence generally, but same-sex domestic violence, um, as a result of that isolation, they're quite intense issues. Now, that's always been with us. That's why we miss Broken Rainbow, although some of that work has missed uh, has moved to Gallup. But I think they're, they're very signif significant issues right now. Sakti alluded to this accelerating homo bi and transphobia that's a, a, a rising as a result of right-wing ideologies um, and that's that that's coming at us like a steam train um, and we need to be prepared for that i think that's a little different to the early 80s but I, 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 there there was that happening there then too um, in many ways the onslaught has shifted and i i, I talked about that a, a bit earlier. With HIV, there was a very significant onslaught of hate in relation to gay men. Um, right now, across media, sometimes in government, um, sometimes from other communities, there's a very significant on, onslaught against transgender people. And that's, I think, a little different now because with visibility comes that level of hate. So we uh, uh, it's sort of like... Um, Always, always being vigilant. It's I think Colleen alluded to it earlier on. It's that constant sense within ourselves and for our colleagues and our peers and our friends and our family and our allies who are LGBTQ, um, that constant vigilance we need to have not to backslide um, and to ensure that the progress we've made continues. Sakti, I'm muted. Please go ahead. Um, well, I don't know about anybody else who is my age, but I certainly feel a sense of um, that kind of time running away in terms of the history that we've created through activism. And the sense that, you know, when you look at young queer people, um, sometimes thinking god are you the people i fought for do you even know that i fought for you? <laughs> you know and and there's something for me about the i suppose difference in experience and difference in it, it just kind of feels like we're going off on different rail tracks that are separating and going to different destinations and it feels to me that's why i think this project is important and that's why I think history is important. And for me, one of the really important things is around more intergenerational conversations about what it is our aspirations were, uh, that the things that we fought for, and what are the aspirations of young people now, and what is it they're fighting for. That feels to me like quite an important uh, conversation to have. Jeff. Projecting a little bit of hope into this, Sakti, is uh, recently, well, last year at the, this, uh, this last February, in fact, I always think last year because COVID, in February, we had a month long history event here. And people of all ages did come, which was great. One of the most hopeful things is that Ashley Joyner came, who's made Are You Proud, which is a younger person who woke up suddenly, being a clubber who had no interest in, in all this political stuff, suddenly woke up to those struggles. I can't remember who said what to him, but it, it was like, oh, my God, Gay Liberation Front went off desperately trying to find out and talking to people from Gay Liberation Front and, and realising that those similar struggles were still here today. They got Dan Glass, you know, United Queerdom. Um, and 
when the Great Liberation Front recently we did out the veterans, I'm a veteran. Um, we <laughs> we went on the we did our own safe, you know, Pride March, uh, social distance, and mask most of the time. With us were quite a lot of young people who were doing work like Ashley, Dan Glass, Dan De Lamotte, various other people, but also young LGBT people seeking asylum. So I think those who those who still feel marginalized, the same issues are there, they recognize the importance of history. If you don't know where you come from, you won't recognize what's happening now. If you don't recognize what's happening now, you've no idea what's going to happen in the future. So, and also, we're creating our histories. Um, so what's different? I think there are similarities and differences. One of the biggest differences is there's a hell of a lot more out there, particularly. So, I mean, I, when I came to see Metro, I was interviewed by you, Emma, in Metro Centre, and then came to the film screening. It's amazing what, what is now there. And I walked out and hey there was a rainbow crossing on the street in Woolwich come on I mean that would have been unheard of Woolwich was Butch City when I was around in Charlton Boys teaching in the 70s so I think there are there is there's a lot difference but I think the big thing that's similar is that until you find it the same isolation until you find where it happens you may know that it's there. You see all these people on, in, on programs, on social media, um, pop stars, film stars. You see all this stuff. But it, if, if it isn't happening in your life and you haven't found out where it happens and what you're hearing at home and in your communities marginalizes you and makes you feel that you are the only one, even though you know you're not, how the hell do you find these other people? And when you do, they're not from your culture. So you've got a real problem there as well. So I think there are similarities in what is happening. It's in a different ball game in many ways. And I'm with you, Greg, totally around the trans thing. It really worries me that sometimes people don't realize who they're in bed with. They're in bed with the far right on this. And it is being engendered in the States. It is being... You, you know, there's a wonderful book called The Pink Line that's out at the moment, um, which is all about a worldwide look. And what you begin to see is the similarities of the dangers that are coming to affect us, particularly around trans and gender queer stuff. The misunderstandings, the misinformation that is out there is worrying. And so I get back to what I said earlier. It's about waking up a little bit. So I think there are differences. There's less isolation than there was. There's more out there that tells us that we do exist. But the similar thing of finding where we are and when we do, finding people like us in where we find. And that can be quite difficult. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Just to add, just to add to that myself, I'm, obviously we're the platform we have now broadcasting this. I mean, in terms of the differences, just technologically and how we communicate and the space that we have here to um, intergenerationally discuss things, as um, uh, Saktu is proposing, is very important. I totally agree, and to be able to engage with the public through um, the social media feed. So, um, certainly from my perspective, this is a very interesting event in terms of how we do talk about issues and open up the forum and i'd like to thank you all so much um for contributing i don't know if any of you want to say anything else i think we're we've reached the point where we we've, we've had some really great questions but i think oh we've got somebody <laughs> colleen just just one last thing on on the final question one of the big differences and I, i've really noticed is there are it doesn't feel like there are many places to go and socialize um because i you know i used to live in islington and at one point i could do a little hop a little bar hop five six different venues now there isn't one and 
whilst you know this is less about being able to drink alcohol this is more about walking into a space and being able to socialize and meet people for, i don't know why it is but for some reason we have less places than before and i think part of that may be an assumption that there is a level of inclusivity that isn't quite there that actually you don't need same-sex venues or lgbt venues because you can go anywhere and actually, no, I can't go to any pub or any bar and sit there and snog a woman. No, it's not true. So yeah, that, I think, is an interesting difference because some would call it progress, but I don't know. Thank you. Very important point to raise, Jeff, to add to that. I would like to just echo that. You know, there's a real myth that we have arrived and it's not true. We have not arrived. Not every parent raises their child saying, if you're really, really lucky, you will find someone to love. And we don't actually care what sex they are. We don't care how you want to express yourself. We just want you to be happy. We have not arrived there. We have not arrived in education. We have not arrived in the social space. You're absolutely right. Because if I go into a local pub in Shrewsbury and I go, oh, even if I don't do it that obviously, I'm going to end up without this nose, you know, and I've protected it so far <laughs> for nearly 50 years of being out. But and, and it's just, you know, if there are still if we are still secretly running off to cruising grounds, we have not arrived. If we are still getting married, we have not arrived. There's, there's a real sense I get that. And particularly a lot of heterosexual people I know who are very liberal, they say, well, what's the issue? You've, you've got equality now. Well, I go, this is like Black Lives Matter, isn't it? You may have all the rights in law as everybody else has, almost, but you are not in the same place. And I think we really need to take that on board. And we need to realise there's a hell of a big job to do still. So... It comes back to what I said, you know, you, you, there are similarities and differences, but do not in any way think that because you have a gay club, because you have your gay space, and you can go and be yourself in that, don't think you've arrived. Don't think you've arrived when you have to have a pride badge. I still want to have those celebrations. Just like there's a Notting Hill carnival, I want a carnival. But let's also remember the politics of where it came from and the struggle it took to get there. Thank you, Jeff. And, and on, on the importance of pride, um, I just, and I'll come to you in just one sec, Greg, but I just want to flag up and maybe we can put something on the social media about it, colleagues who are in the background, that we have a campaign at the moment, Pride First, where we're building an online exhibition and um, really exploring the, the significance of pride, but also the, the different nuances and how it's, it's changed over the years and um, all the diversity of it. So if you have, um, if you'd like to contribute, you can email pridefirst at metrocharity.org. Uh, UK. Greg. So the, this, this Our History project has been f phenomenally important in terms of um, collecting and um, storing our archive, in terms of producing the film, in terms of providing voices to people, but also remembering this last 37 years of Metro's history. And what I think the most fundamental thing it's done has now given us systems going forward to ensure that all of us become better archivists. Because as Jeff's pointed out, as we continue the struggle, there's going to be even greater need over the next 13 years when, when we turn 50 as a charity, and I look forward to that date, um, to have recorded this 13 years as we emerge from this pandemic and as we begin to tackle some of those issues I've talked about before in relation to um, mental health isolation, domestic violence, the range of different things that are that are cropping up. So we are much better at collecting the sorts of um, spoken word and um, material and objects that we need to ensure that our history continues to be um, important and collective. Absolutely. Did we have anybody else? Um, we, I've got a, a, an interesting comment come in here from Ian Beaver. Um, 
saying the online apps have drained the mass of other people going to venues to meet others. Um, so again, I mean, sort of, I suppose, tagging on to what we we're talking about, the, the advantages of technology, but then perhaps some of the disadvantages in how we're communicating and congregating. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to add to that. Well, if you can ask, I'll always, I've always got something to say, I? <laughs> <laughs> That's why we invited you. <laughs> um, it's, it's not so much to, uh, to, to agree or disagree with Ian's comment, and thank you, Ian. It was just actually at, at a point that we still have that rural, urban experience as well. So I, I, I came out to London, I live most of my life in London, I have since moved to a little village in just outside Cambridge City, and I can pop into Cambridge, but I, I feel the sense of, um, is it just me here? <laughs> Am I, you know, and yes, Jeff, you're, you're right. But the experience is very different being LGBT in rural and urban areas, um, which, which is more about connecting with people and less about technology. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I would just like to say, I mean, online apps, you know, the, for gay men, they're the new cottaging, aren't they? Um, as they close the toilets, you know, we've got the apps. It's a great way to meet people, but it can lead to that sense of my identity revolves around what I do rather than who I am. I think there's a bit of that. Um, there is, on the other hand, I think there's a positive side because I know people have met through it, but there's a danger. If you watch films on uh, Georgia in, you know, in the old USSR Georgia, um, if you watch films on Russia, you will find that people who do not like us are meeting us on those apps. So I would say there's a danger in the apps as well that people need to be aware of. And just always, if you are going to use an app to meet someone, make sure you meet them somewhere public. Thank you. Sakti. I'm just really curious to see after lockdown and all of the online interaction we've all had to do primarily, um, how much online dating and online hookups are going to continue as the preferred mode of interaction? Because I think actually what's going to happen is that people will be desperate to connect face to face. That's my personal kind of, I'd love to see it. <laughs> And Garden Soulmates has ended, so we will be desperate to connect in person. <laughs> but definitely there's the um, feedback from our ser recent service user survey is that people are really keen to get back to face-to-face -to -face services. And obviously that's something we're all, uh, or organizations are working towards, but it's um, just shows that yeah, the need for that human contact. And we, we heard from Natalie in the film about the drop-in and Metro's drop-in um continues but running something like that remotely which is actually is a therapeutic space but it's also an incredibly important social space for just peer support and people just like you say just meeting and being together there are few of those spaces <laughs> but not touching and i think that's one of the biggest things we had a visitor come today uh a straight guy and he's one of those guys who you you know you immediately want to hug and we couldn't and we both felt that, you know, and it's great that there is online meeting. I think, um, yeah, it's been a savior, Zoom and all these things. They've been, they've saved a lot of people's lives, I'm sure. They've, they've connected people on a level. But by God, you know, we need to, I, I can't wait. I mean, as a massage therapist as well, <laughs> let's get back to touching and hugging and caring on a different level. But, Equally, yeah, this virtual way of meeting has its limits, but it has been a saviour. It has been a wonderful, thank God we did have the inter internet and that people could develop these things. Wonderful. Beautifully put, Jeff. So on that note, I think I'm going to wrap up unless anybody's got a burning desire to say anything else. Um, but is it uh, wonderful to, oh, Colleen. <laughs> 
it's wonderful to connect with you all and um it was wonderful to lead the art history project myself um it was a great privilege and um i learned a huge deal um but it really it was it was an incredible way of connecting with so many wonderful people even though i do live north of the river in london <laughs> i'm ashamed to admit <laughs> we have some really good gay bars in east london <laughs> and clubs <laughs> just saying <laughs> Um, but thank you all and thank you Tom Line for directing an amazing film and going above and beyond and to uh, and also Chris Scales who was our archivist um, and all the volunteers who worked in the Art History Project. It really was a, um, people did go above and beyond and that's why we, we have that wonderful film in the archive. So thank you and good night to the audience. I believe Tom are you there wrapping things up for us? And um, oh. We're gone.